to the performative world with Sasha Pereira or Pereira Elsewhere is your artist name. You are an award-winning um, pop auteur, experimental pop auteur. You're a producer, you're a songwriter, you're a DJ. Uh, you have uh, uh, garnered a lot of critical acclaim. And your use of technology to create an experiment with your voice and your lyrics and the beats and the bass frequencies and the sound design is also in a way exploring the human experience. So um, you're inherently transdisciplinary in your approach. Uh, you're based in Berlin, you've been here over two decades, you're originally from the UK. Um, actually I just learned you have a background in uh, European political studies. Mm -hmm. um, just like last week was the prime <coughs> background of our speakers here. Um, so that said, um, thank you for being here. I'm very excited and the stage is yours. Okay. And please a warm applause for Sasha. Thanks. I'm here, right? <coughs> First I want to say, great intro, three words. Discipline, undiscipline. undiscipline, error and stunt. All of those things I'm into. I'm incredibly undisciplined as a person. Um, I really, really uh, value error and coincidence and chance rather than intention. I see it almost as spirituality. And stunt, for sure, I'm a stunt woman and it's probably a stunt that I'm here. So I'm probably going to tell you a little bit about myself in this as a person and also my musical journey that got me here. I'm autodidact in terms of music tech and I studied European politics and German, and in the end I ended up doing like a lot of film and history modules. So for sure I'm transdisciplinary. I think I'm going to show you, first of all, something. It's not my computer, so bear with me. Where is it? The, the link's here, okay. As um, Lucas said, I just won an award and they did a little profile on me. Maybe it will kind of um, give you an idea of kind of who I am, if I can find it. Hmm. Here. Okay, it's, it's hooked up to sound, right? Yeah. Okay. Hope it doesn't blast you. I'm Pereira Elsewhere, Sasha Pereira. I'm a producer, an instrumentalist, a vocalist, a songwriter, a tech head. And the live gig is very different to what I produce on the album. There's a massive um, element of spontaneity because I actually take humans with me who can mess things up, which I really like. And I think my visuals are just next level, seriously. <laughs> I think the combination of these people with this music and these visuals is very special. I guess people are really surprised when they turn up and are playing the trumpet through a pitch shifter with like a whole layered trumpet thing happening. Music really is like, it's cultural goods, you know? It's cultural, it's of a massive cultural value and I think it has been undervalued in our society even though it's utilised by all people. Okay, I hope that was loud enough. Um, I'm going to start telling you a little bit. I'm going to start telling you a bit about myself. So why am I in Berlin and why did I get here so early? And it is in a way nice that I got here early because not everyone was here yet. Um, I come from London. I was born in London. My parents are both Sri Lankan. They're both from two sides of a civil war and have two different religions. Probably my first early musical experiences were in a temple where people were just singing and sitting on the floor and playing percussion and actually probably quite spiritual. Then at the same time you had like pop music, like everyone in the 80s. You just had Madonna, you had Michael Jackson, you just had mainstream global pop music. 
And then you had this kind of Asian angle as well. Then the 90s happened, and I feel quite lucky to have lived in London in the 90s because there were a lot of genres which just crossed over each other at the same time, where people from all walks of life seemed to come together to make what seemed to be music, new music at the time. And funnily enough, I feel like my youth time has in a way been not recycled, because I wouldn't say it's entirely recycled. I think it's part of maybe a prolonged cultural block of electronic music culture, which has come from that time, right? Um, I have chosen sound as a medium, but I might have been able to choose something else as a, as a medium, because I think I like to communicate, and I have creative ideas, I have aesthetic ideas, I have sound ideas. I have quite a strong idea of what I like. I like lots of things, but then there's a bunch of stuff I really kind of hate, right? Which has all come together to make me this person. I started for sure as a music fan and a consumer of music, and I always looked at going to a sound system kind of as, as almost a social community event, which is about people from hopefully different walks of life coming together, not all of the same demographic group, and not necessarily a 100% money-making system. And if it does make money, it should still be accessible to people. So that was my basis, in a way, for club music. Growing up in London, um, you just have you had a lot of polyrhythms around you. Even if you wait at a bus stop in London, you'll sometimes hear like this dad driving his kid to school and he has pimped his car so hard that the bass is vibrating and his children have to listen to that and he's playing a pirate radio. I love Berlin, but I miss that a bit here. It's not the same with Radio Eins, sorry. <laughs> so probably all of these things on top of each other influenced me because London has been a melting pot of music that um, probably that just lives inside me. My willingness to approach lots of different kinds of music and also the era I grew up in, being the 90s, where there were really crossovers of music, right? So when I moved to Berlin, why did I move to Berlin? Because I did Erasmus in Cologne and I had pink hair and everyone was like, dude, why are you here? You should be in, Col in Berlin. And I was like, well, what is that? And they said, go stay with my friend. And whenever they rang someone and said, go stay with my friend, the friend was like, sure. Let her come, she stay for months. It was not like now, and it was not like go on Airbnb, that's my room. You know, it was not, the experience of Berlin was not commodified at that time, I would say. They were really surprised to see me. So um, I came to Berlin after I'd finished, and I was into all this music, and for some reason I knew I wanted to be here because I wanted to be an artist in some format, right? I didn't want to be a pop musician, I wanted to be an artist, right? So I started messing around with tech. And somehow, like, my biggest hero was Aphex Twin, and I did imagine Aphex Twin going in, like, an elevator under the earth to a vault with, like, 80 computers using DOS and making this music. I thought, this is not something which... I, I mean, maybe he was, right? But there was no... There, you couldn't go on YouTube and be like, how did Aphex Twin make that beat? You had... It was almost like mythology, do you know what I mean? So I was like, OK. That's going to take me a long time, and in that time, maybe I've got to do something, you know? So I was like, okay, I played the trumpet, I played keys as a kid. I said I'm very undisciplined. I'm not really good at lessons, not really good at like doing the same thing. I want to have my own opinions before reading to the end of the paragraph, that kind of person, right? And um, so I was like, okay, I obviously have a mouth, I can obviously have a rhythmic feeling, and getting on the mic is the first thing I'm going to do. It's also a cliche of who I am. I'm a brown female. That's what brown females do, right? They don't go in a vault in the elevator to the mine to get on the DOS computer. Not in the time that I moved here. Luckily, the people around me, who were actually white cis men, believe it or not, said, you know what, dude, get gear. Get gear. Go. Get some Genelex. First thing I invested in was Genelex because I knew even if I didn't write a note of music in my life, I'm still going to want to listen to other people's music in my house on great speakers, which I still have to this day. And they said, go get a MIDI keyboard. I just got a shitty MIDI keyboard, a shitty sound card. And they said, here, look. And I opened up this folder of like CDs, and they said, these are the cracks. <laughs> yeah? So I'd go over and like copy CDs, and that's kind of how I started. So these white cis men were, were like, just do your thing in your time. But still, you know, I was writing songs. I'm going to play you the first song which, I don't know if it was well, actually one of the first two songs I wrote. It's called Black Barbie. It came out about four or five years after I wrote it. That was the picture disc. 
It's a live picture from a show I played at the Love Parade, and I'm wearing a sweater from a university called Brown, which is an Ivy League university in America, where there are not very many brown people. I think this irony was lost in this time. I think people who heard my song probably thought I was talking about myself. The song is about the role of the female black entertainer in the music industry since Josephine Baker and since the cliche of the black woman in the entertainment industry and the white gaze, which is why it's called Black Barbie. I'm going to play it to you. It was made in oh, 2002. I recorded this song. We made it on the first version of Ableton. I said to my friend from my band, Robert Koch, I need a dance will be, and he made me a very broken dance will be, because I already had an idea for this song. Um, there's a drug reference in that. It's a trick question. Who can spot the drug reference? I know we're on campus, but yeah, reality, right? Okay, also, we lost the files. We didn't have a computer. We recorded on our friend's computer, a PC. Made music on a PC, three PCs before I got a Mac. Just saying, tech doesn't matter. Ideas are more important. We lost the tracks. His computer broke, so we actually just mastered this track without really mixing it. We sent it to Aphex Twins label, and he wrote back only about this song, which was kind of nice for me. Can we make it much louder? This is this, right? I think you get the idea. It sounds pretty broken and dirty. And um, John Peel played that track. I don't know if anyone's familiar with John Peel. It was uh, somebody who collects a lot of music in England and was quite a force for certain people. He died a few years, a few years later. Um, what was I going to say after that? Um, so I'm angry, I'm funny, and I'm angry. And there's all these like immigrant hate race. Uh, actually, the one friend of mine from New York who's black who moved here at the same time as me listened to my first album and he goes, it's all about race, class and gender, Sash. And I was like, yeah, what did you think it was going to be about? Love, right? Or what, you know? So this has been a continuing thing in my music. I think when I first started, I was angrier and didn't... I feel happy that I produce music now so I can make an instrumental track which puts all my emotions inside without actually writing words. I'm happy that I play instruments, like the trumpet, that I can put stuff into without... So it's more of an abstract... People understand what my message is, but I don't have to, like, nail it into their face every day, right? So, um, what was I going to say? Um, we were kind of dirty, punky, played a lot. That was the first album. I'm going to play you a track from the third album from my project, Jacuzzi, which came out on B-Pitch Control in 2010. 
I think you see similarities in the message. In that song, Black Barbie, did anybody recognize what the hook line is stolen from? There's a track called Black Magic Woman by Santana, and basically I've stolen that into the hook and put it on a dance hall feminist anti-racism track, right? And so I think in my whole career, there's always been times that I quote pop culture. I don't want to be in pop culture, but I want to quote it because it's something that affects all of us, right? You see this later, I've done a cover of 50 Cent's um, song, Candy Shop. It's called Karam, and again, it's taking that song into a completely different context, but there is a way that I want to remain I do refer to pop culture in my stuff, even though I don't want to be part of it because I want to protect myself, <laughs> basically. Okay, I'm going to play you a track called Read the Books. We're much more sophisticated by now. It's like Ableton 8, and <laughs> uh, we sound fatter because we've played in places live, and we realise we've got to sound fatter because we're part of the music industry now. We're not just in like a cellar in Friedrichshain fucking around with Ableton 1, right? But you're still going to feel a lot of the same energy of the same person. Oops, see there is it. Okay. If you read the books everyone is reading, you can only think what everybody's thinking. If you listen to what everyone is saying, you can only say what everyone is saying If you listen to what everybody's listening You can only hear what everyone is hearing You believe what everyone else is thinking We can only live the way that we've been living To achieve just what we believe in You gotta keep on dreaming, yeah, yeah Keep on dreaming and, and keep on dreaming and, 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 If you read the books everyone is reading You can only think what everybody's thinking If you listen to what everyone is saying You can only say what everyone is saying If you listen to what everybody's listening You can only hear what everyone is hearing You believe what everyone else is thinking As you can hear, you can hear me, we got kind of fancy, right? And, but the message in there is actually a quote from a Murakami book. But that message in there, I think it's something which you feel inside me over a long period of time. Because basically what I'm saying is what Lucas said, we live in a bubble, all of us live in a bubble, and to reach out on your bubble requires curiosity, motivation, interest, probably self-confidence, sadly, which is why the richest people do it or the most middle class people do it, and all that's exactly what I'm trying to say. We talk about intersectionality, but it should be a real thing, actually. I mean that in the sense, like, talk to your cab driver, literally talk to your cab driver, because that's the person who doesn't get into bad kind, who doesn't get into any of the places that we all get into, but they drive us in between these places. So I think you feel in what I make, there's always there's some kind of message which is... I guess it is an elsewhere message because you don't want to be in the middle of what's... Re I don't really, don't really politically agree with what, what, what happens really in the mainstream of our society on an ethical level. Okay, so in this time, I'm on tour. We're getting, like, hits. We've got gigs. We're making monies like this. And then Sasha's like, shit, I've got to find the real truth. This can't be the truth, yeah? So I start making tunes in my house. And I do everything wrong, kind of on purpose, or like it, right? So by this point, some people in Japan be like, can you do a vocal for this? 
and I get the studio mic, put it in my apartment, and just do the vocal and get paid for it. Either I do it under that name or another name. But this mic was like this really nice condenser mic, in my which is usually in my studio. It was in my bedroom in Alexanderplatz, in my one-room apartment, just looking at me all the time. And I was like, okay, I've got to do something. It's this, it was winter of 2010. It was really cold for like three months. It was horrible. It was like minus 13. You go to Lidl. And uh, I started recording on a line out, on a guitar which had no line out, and was playing. I'm not a good guitar player. I can play chords on a guitar, but I'm a bad guitar player. Terrible, you know? So I was using it for the atmosphere, so I'd record bits and make loops, yeah? And I love the fact that I turned the compression up so much. I don't know if anyone here, do people study audio tech here? Or they're more general art. Some of you study audio tech. So if I say you turn up the compression to ridiculous amounts, yeah? And you just got the mic gain up so loud that when you go, it's like someone just died, right? And you put tons of reverb on top and you start making these guitar things, which for me sounded very, very reduced. And then I put my voice in the middle of it, and I felt like this is a completely different listening experience to what I'd done before. And I'd always been seen as this extremely energetic, hateful person. So I am an extremely energetic, hateful person. But I also have like a nice, really soft, sweet side to me. And people were so shocked when I played it to them that I was like, damn, I love shocking people. So I just carried on doing this, and it became my solo project. Yeah? Also, because when you're 10 years in a band, it's a bit like, it's like a really fucked up marriage. You don't fuck anymore. You're just fucking there next to each other looking at the ceiling. <laughs> so I think, in a way, this is why I sort of moved to doing my own thing. I'm going to show you Bizarre. I talked about error before, yeah? The hook line on this song... Woo! The hook line... What happened? The hook line on this song is an error. I did some hook which was horrible, just, just horrible. And on the, when, on the end, I like jammed out the word. It's so bizarre. And it was one take, and I heard it on the end, and I was like, okay, that's the magic. So what I feel like I do is I make stuff. A lot of it is shit, and some of it I feel I know where the magic is, and I call it like curating. It's like looking for gold through shit, you know? And I always say that you and your, and your instincts, what you've heard ar around, is bigger than the tech, you know? Anything you recognise as being sort of good, emotionally touching, authentic, original, hat fuss, you know what I mean? That is it, that's the skill. The, you're never, the tech is not bigger than you. The tech is just like having a pair of scissors you might want to cut something with, you know? I say that because I do workshops sometimes with people who are learning, and I think the tech is really scary for a lot of people, and it should hopefully not be. Okay. Can you make it a bit louder? It's been a long time by the look of things. A long time money's running everything. The same ten families around the show. Friends with the president, the friends with the pope. It's been a long time holding up this hopes until this wrong time's over. Let's make the most of it. So surreal, this fast of ours, like a thin girl wearing a padded bra. It's so.
for your recording. Okay, um, people on Tumblr really got into that. I don't know if you lot were into Tumblr. It's, you got me? Um, I really loved Tumblr. I thought it was a really special time on the internet. It was like the second time I thought the internet was special in my life. I thought MySpace was special and I thought Tumblr was special. So with my old project Jacuzzi, we were kind of like big on MySpace. And with this, suddenly I was like not big on Tumblr, but there was a certain amount of people who were talking about it, resharing it. Some I had the zeitgeist, which was happening for all these like emo, C-punk motherfuckers, and suddenly I was with them. And they named it Doom Folk. I didn't call it Doom Folk. Um, they did. And I kind of liked it because I feel like it should be an interactive experience. There are so many names for genres. Music is just music. If people want to name it Doom Folk, that's cool. I'm actually, it's a compliment that they even want to talk about your music or even listen to your music with the amount of music that's out there today. So I'm fine with this conversation. And then people just requote it and assume that I called it that. So this is also part of my process. I also want to involve society. I'm a product of society. It's okay, they can call it what they want, right? Um, the only problem was everyone thought I was a singer-songwriter. The other thing they didn't notice, which was really cool, is they didn't notice the same chick from the band before. <laughs> Aced it, right? Because the music industry just wants to eat you up, categorize you, next, 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 black person, next, right? So with this, they actually didn't realize it was the same person, and I didn't put it out in the promo. I didn't say, oh, that chick from Jacuzzi has now done Pereira elsewhere. So it's really funny. Now I meet people who are older, who, don't, who know Jacuzzi and have no idea that I'm playing at Sonar next week, right? They think that I'm just in a cupboard somewhere in Kreuzberg doing something. And then you have all these kids who, in a way, they don't know that I did this stuff before, and some of them are rediscovering it. I saw this girl playing a Jacuzzi track in a horse set, and I was really touched that she's you know, so um, the problem with thinking you're a singer-songwriter is I got on the stage and I was like, I can't play this guitar, shit, I was looping it, right? Um, in the process, I got fatter as a musician, I just became, started producing it properly. This for me is like sketches, and I was really happy with the aesthetic because it was just a strange aesthetic, right? Or putting loads of reverb on something and not EQing the reverb, Pitchfork were like, she's a frigid princess in a castle. I didn't know that you could EQ reverb. I think ignorance is bliss, you know? Jimi Hendrix put tons of shit on his guitars where the people at SAE would have said, don't do that, that's wrong, you know? And he created a genre. So I really think that ignorance is one of the most blissful things about if people can get access to bit of inspiration and technology, that is where really things are born, to be honest, in the area of ignorance and confidence, weirdly enough. <laughs> um, I'm going to go to... So I keep talking about... Um, I have sound aesthetic, for me, plays a massive role. I don't, I, there's only a couple of people who make music here, but I'm not really into... MIDI sounds or stuff which sounds like it just came out of a loop pack or a factory. I spiritually feel like I need to spend si time with these sounds. Sometimes I get like a recording of my mum singing and I'll just like tweak it and it's in there. Nobody knows it's in there, but it's kind of in there. I can show you something, just because I don't want to bore you all with me talking. I'm probably just going to show you something of me about five years ago sounding very deep talking about the spirituality of sound and sound leakage and stuff like this. I'm creating my own kind of format of spirituality, if you want, you know? The way I choose percussion, for example, I went to the London Philharmonic Orchestra website, they've got loads of free sounds you can use. They've got sheep's toenails, which they've recorded. So I'm using sheep's toenails as percussion. Nobody knows that. When they listen to my track on Pitchfork or whatever, they don't know that, but I know that. And I know that there's an animal inside my music. And I forget about it afterwards, not every time I think about it, but it's in the process. There are just little things which all these details of coincidence and chance have a form of spirituality for me. All right, so you see me here in the studio. I record in the studio sometimes, but I also, when I go away, I take gear with me. And I'll record just somewhere in a weird room, somewhere in a hotel, in a cupboard, in the rainforest. I'll leave the windows open, because some of that sound leakage, I like it because it's like, showing what is happening in that moment. You can't remove it afterwards. It's not something you choose to add. Okay, let me just add, like, wind or birds. It's already in the audio recording, and there's something about that space and the sound leakage from the other rooms or whatever, which, it sounds stupid, but I'm looking for some form of spirituality, I guess. I'm faking it. I'm looking at it for myself. Join me if you want, you know? 
So this is probably some of the reasons that I don't, I don't really see myself as a singer. Also, technically, do you understand that in America they don't see Sade as a singer? Sade is not a singer. In it's like Eric Satie was not a pianist. You get it? Uh, in some cultures, there's so much music culture in the voice that people from gospel they have been singing escalators of sound since they're born. I'm not that. I write vocals which fit to my voice and fit to the piece of music and has a vocal message inside it. I don't see myself as a singer. I don't sit in the shower trying to sing Beyonce songs which I can't sing. You know, I'm using what I have in my capacity, which is my ears which feel sound in a certain way. It's the emotionality that I feel within music, that's what I'm transporting. And I use my voice. Sure, I kind of sing, but I'm kind of a vocalist. So when people go, oh, you're a singer, aren't you? I always feel a little bit like, yeah, I kind of use my voice, but it's really just, just part of a, it's part of many other things that I use to create a, pro a message, a voyage, a sound experience, which um, I'm into for the long term, basically. It's, uh, it's supposed to be a long-term experience for me. <laughs> um, then I'm going to go to a bit on tech. I'm used to a lot of people being into tech, which is why I'm going to talk about it. I use stuff outside of the box. I use stuff in the box. So if somebody's like, hey, I've got a vintage synthesizer, I'll go over there, I'll record a bunch of stuff, and I'll use it in my tracks. I also use VSTs. Once I was like, I need a Rhodes, I um, just Google the Rhodes VST. It's like the trashiest Rhodes you have ever seen in your life. I still use it in my live show. To me, it's part of also, again, kind of pop culture, using all this tech together and not being a purist because... I don't know, purism is not for me. I am not a purist. As I said, I'm even um, just going to refer to Sri Lanka for one second. I have friends who are fully Tamil or fully Sinhala. They are more purist than me. My parents have two different languages, two different religions, and a war between them. So you didn't even have one language at home, right? So I'm definitely not a purist. I'm going to leave this purism for some other people. And perfectionism is also not my thing because I really believe in individuals and a personal approach to stuff is far, far more important than perfectionism, you know? Um, what am I going to say? What time are we at, guys? Well, you have nearly 15 minutes left. I have 15 minutes left, okay. Ooh. Let me see, what did I bring you? I'm going to show you... I talked about in that little thing which kind of introduced me, I don't know if you heard it, there was so much bass on the sound system that you probably couldn't understand my London accent with all this woom woom happening around it. What I said is, okay, so I produce music alone in my studio, I produce these really nice pristine albums with lots of sound design where I get my sheep toenails and I put them in the right pan and I surround sound with all my pitched vocals sounding like my own boyfriend, stuff like this. But when you get to a live show, I try to take, I play solo live sometimes, but I actually really like taking my drummer and bass pair because they're humans and they can fuck shit up, actually. And I really enjoy this process of being on the stage, having spontaneity, having three people energy. Also, I like playing in a small arts place in the corner. I'm fine with it, but I also like playing big fucking stage, right? A big fucking stage, I want to have my crew with me. I take uh, my drummer and my bass pair because they are... One, very, very good musicians. Two, they really fit my team. They're both heterosexual cis men. Should I feel guilty about this? I don't. I don't because I take them to places where the sound guy comes to and says, Hi, I'm pussy. And then they have to go there. And I love this, actually. This is another thing about my intersectionality, that I want to go places I wouldn't have been. I want to take other people to places that they haven't been. And I want people to come and from whatever walk of life to see me. And I'd rather they hate it and say that, then, you know, I feel like the culture that we have is something we need to do together. I'll give you a small example. I DJed at the Philharmonic the other day because they want to let in young, exciting, brown people into their building. They put us in the foyer. Someone else played before me. There was one guy in the orchestra who was playing percussion. He was 21 years old. He looked like he was going to sell me drugs at Goldie. It was great. So obviously we bonded, became friends. And he was dancing during my DJ set. I watched the show, it was Strauss, I thought it was really amazing, and he said the majority of the orchestra was standing on the balcony, looking down like it was a zoo, yeah, not coming down to the sound system, just 
you know, vibing with it for a second. And I thought, wow, that's really amazing that me and a bunch of people I know would go and watch Strauss. We don't care whether what they look like. We don't care that there was like two women in there and everyone was white. It doesn't bother me. It's music, right? But I think there are a lot of people who really live in these really, really odd, oddly separate ways and, and not as connected to music as other people because in the end you should go to places for music. Anyway, I took a major tangent. On the stage, what I'm going to show you is just a little snippet of me playing at Mira Festival in Barcelona. The sound is recorded from the mixing desk and it's just an example of a track where I've taken sounds that I've produced in the production. I've put them onto my keyboard so I can play them live. I've taken my drummer and my bass player and this is real timing. There's no quantized beat. I make quantized electronic music. Well, it's not quantized because I move stuff around, but I'm making stuff on a grid in Ableton, right? So this is just an example of real time, and I like the fact that we have to look at each other and actually feel a moment, and we could fuck it up and look stupid. I enjoy that. I don't like looking stupid, but it makes sometimes exciting, right? <laughs> If you drive through my mind All the images you will see Pretty pictures all the time Kill these fantasies of mine Hope you don't cry Hope you don't cry If you drive through my mind All the images you will see Pretty pictures all the time Killed these fantasies of mine Hope you don't cry Hope you don't cry Hope you don't cry Hope you don't cry So I'm going to finish on that. Well, the reason I've played you those two videos is because one, the one before is more organic sounding and this is definitely more produced plastic sounding, if you want, plastic versus organic. And I believe we're made up of all of these things in, us, in, in ourselves and in the world we live in. So my aim is to kind of 
bridge these two things, I think, in what I do. So thank you very much for listening. Okay. Ich bin, ich bin auch Fragen auf Deutsch stellen. Ich kann auch Deutsch. Ich mag einfach nicht äh, so eine Rede auf Deutsch halten. Thank you so much. Okay. Please, please stay here. Now we come oh. to the Q&A. Oh. Is my mic on? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, thank you, first of all. Thank um, you. You get ready for your questions. Uh, I'll break the ice, kind of the, the usual ones. Um, first of all, I love um, how weird your work is. And I made this as a complete <laughs> compliment. I'm, I'm a big fan of weird and weirding in the sense that it resists a clear frame of reference. Like it, it, it can't really be put into a certain category. It's hard you when you're trying to get that Spotify listing. Exactly. The, uh, uh. the term <laughs> do folk you mentioned um, that was given to you, but it also doesn't really fit. And I love when things don't really fit into a category. So wonderful to that one. Um, you mentioned your process in a way as looking for gold and digging for gold and shit. But could you maybe elaborate a little bit more on, and my mic is still on or not? Um, about your way of working, mm -hmm. your methodology, so to speak. Um, because there is more, as you said, to the music, but there's also a visual aspect to the whole thing. Now, I'm, this is a good sound. Phew. Sounding good. Now we're Look talking. at that. So there's more to the just, so just sounds, there's visuals to it. Um, so how do you... Mm, how do you start? Is there such a thing that you kind of, after all these years of okay. working in this business, so do you have a certain methodology? I somehow a there's, a con there's a rote linea. Like if you listen to my prior Elsewhere albums, there are four instrumental tracks, usually in eight songs, right? When I'm writing songs, I hate vocals. I don't need vocals in music I listen to unless I really like them. So I'm really judgmental. If I'm writing a song, I literally start with chords, start doing the vocal. I put a few weird sounds in so I don't feel, so I still feel weird, right? And then when the vocal is there, I'm like, is there magic in that vocal or not? If there's no magic in that vocal, I don't need that vocal. With the instrumental stuff, I really let myself just flow according to whatever tech I'm using and just move along. I often use my voice as like snippets or samples or use it as an elongated ooh, ah, but I'm not as structured with the instrumental stuff and I really enjoy that. And with the song stuff, you have to, in a way, be more structured. On the visual aspect, I think I made a really clever decision of working with basically one of my best friends. He's someone who, I don't know if anyone, if you ever see my haircut on the net, he's done it for like years since I know him. He's also a very multidisciplinary person who can make videos, can uh, do graphics, can make clothes, can uh, probably make a really decent album on GarageBand in about one night. Mm. That would put a lot of people to shame, I guess. He's really a multidisciplinary person, and I, we share a lot of things in our world, especially irony, humor, satire. Extremely mm. important, I think, to survive this life. Mm. And I don't change my graphic person every album. I just feel like there's a continuity. And I'm not so into it when you see someone bring out work, it's like, oh, they just went for a photo shoot. They just went to Hebel and Amara, and they just got the new Adidas, and they just got the new... And oh, they just borrowed all the stuff, and you're like, oh, but they just look like they just went to a fashion shooting. I want to look like stuff has grown with me, been with me, comes from me. I want to add new stuff, but I definitely want to have elements and continuity. And that comes from, I think, working with the same person, and we use this thing, it's called availability. It's a very fancy mm. word, but it just means use what the fuck is around you rather than look too far. We don't have huge budgets. If you want to be an independent musician, you don't have huge budgets. Live with that. Hmm. Okay, <laughs> note, first lecture, my introduction, when I all overkilled you with a lot of theoretical input. Your you own narrative. No, yeah, but the first, my first introduction lecture, not tonight. Do you remember the uh, role of the bricoleur, Claude Lévi-Strauss, Savage Mind? Does it, do you remember? Anyways, the bricoleur is basically creating something out of what's there, the availability. It's you don't a fancy have to word for what everyone does. Yeah. It's what every immigrant does, actually, is availability. What every person in hearts does is availability. <laughs> do you have a question already from the crowd? Otherwise, I can connect one more. So I'll give you one minute more to think about it, and then... I liked your thing on um, determine your own narrative. It's extremely important to me. I just produced a few tracks for Nina Tragen's new album. Mm -hmm. And it was nice to work with her, but I thought it was incredible how many people were around her in this team, how many people are sending stuff around, how much stuff is said. Mm. I wouldn't want to be in that position. Mm. And that's what people, what happens to you as an artist, that 
I think it's extremely important to protect yourself. You need to try and curate your own narrative, control your own narrative. That's so true. It can mean a lot less money, but long term you'll be happier as an I individual. I think this is most powerfully visible actually in the music industry, even more than in the visual arts, is, is my feeling. I wanted to add on, you, you mentioned your friend, um, the notion of collaboration. Um, what's um, an available, you kind of answered it, but is there another, what's your key to success to working with someone over such a long period of time? Not getting in an argument, not breaking up, etc. So, what's the what's your key? Because this is kind of what I'm pushing here: like collaborate, engage, get in dialogue, work with others. You don't have to do it on your own. This, you know, it's one of the key messages that I'm trying to bring. I'm across. very happy to have a solo project because I do think it's really hard to work with people over years. Um, my friend Hugo, we have more intense periods when we're creating visuals for the album. But even when I've, if I've made like a few tracks for something, I'll be like, you want to hear some of the new music? And if you'll give me some feedback, I actually like, I trust him as a person. Trust mm -hmm. is probably an integral point. T trust in taste mm -hmm. and personal human touch. I've met his mum, he's met my mum. They both do the same thing. Play them something, they'll be like, oh, I'm going to make a tea. <laughs> and they just like don't know what the fuck to say to this stuff. We're united in this. Mm -hmm. Nice. <laughs> okay, but now I broke the ice. Question for you. First question here. Yeah, thank you very much, Mike. Thank you. Special one because uh, it was the first uh, lecture of music and product production, and that was really nice for me. So, um, yeah, I wanted to ask, like, do you just, uh, I don't know, get up and start uh, working and, like, start producing and messing around with stuff and with songs? And or do you like um, chill and then and you just uh, start working on an idea if it pops up in your head? Like, or is there no? Like I mean, my life's pretty hectic. So let's say put it in the in the way I ideally like to work, and I think the best way to work is is to focus on making something, not judge it too much, not do it for too long, come back and listen to it another day and feel what you really instinctually feel and work on a few different things parallel, not like headbang against one thing at all. Also change about your tech, you know? So I, or I don't have everything patched in the nice, we talked about undisciplined. People go to people's studios, everything's patched and labels. Mine's like, okay, I've got to climb behind that and like plug it in. But for some reason, it's sort of part of my process. I would like to be a little bit less chaotic, but uh, sometimes I go away and I take a smaller amount of gear and I focus more because sometimes having many things is super distracting. But basically, I don't have one way to work. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, but that's interesting actually because, like, for myself, I, I sometimes feel like if I if I start working on too many different ideas or projects, I kind of lose the the focus on and like I'm always starting something new and. I think yeah, if like, you. Oh, fuck, I, have, like, 20 ideas I think if you use some of the same tech, some of the same sounds within those audio projects you're working on, you can actually get some consistency. You know, if you keep like going through and auditioning hundreds of sounds and looking at fucked up graphics of VSTs and get confused, it's better to be like, oh, those two things I like. You know, some people do this. Of course, I don't. They'll be already like saved, like their starting arrangement with their bass already saved and then do the effects. Not like that. I think it actually, I think I enjoy the like, I don't know where it's going. I see the light. That's me. Doesn't mean people work like that, though. Um, that's why I think try and get some consistency of sound. Yeah, because like, I feel Maybe we can jump to another, another question. <laughs> <laughs> um, Did you have a question? Um, yeah. um, uh, do you think you could expand a little on like, um, your main influences, maybe growing up? Or, and it would be interesting to hear about what sort of stuff feeds. Expand on your influence and So I guess when you were a kid, you were really thinking about music without even knowing it, yeah? So if, as I said, I was in the temple as a Hindu child with a bunch of Hindus sitting on the floor playing veena guitar and stuff, right? Um, I think then later, I really just got into bass and hybrids of bass music and warp records kind of as a teenager was like, whoa, you know, I was into drum bass and jungle and two-step and stuff like this, you know. I was also really into Bangra. It was just an exciting time to have things sort of cross over. 
But I moved to Singapore when I was eight for two years. There was a mosque on the corner. There was Chinese music in the mall way before people had K-pop here, you know? So I think like moving to Singapore was also like, okay, now there's Chinese music, there's Mandarin pop in the mall. It was also like another boof, boof. And I think it was, I mean, definitely have a bit of, I, sometimes I'm jealous of the people who grow up in the same place. Both parents come from the same place. The majority of people are from the same class in their village. They all go to the same school. They walk across that road, they get on that bus. A bit jealous of them because I think you actually just have less life trauma. But I think the influences which all this like boof, boof, boof kind of has made me open, so. Yes, please. or is it something that kind of like fades out and then if you stop working and then it's kind of like... Okay, Deadline. Like just repeat for our online audience, the question was, because they can't hear, um, when is the, the project question finished? Was, when is the pro uh, project finished? I find it as hard as anyone else to finish. I think I have a clearer idea of when something's finished now than ever before in my life, so great for me, right? But um, deadline plays a huge role for me. I'm a deadline-oriented person. I'm chaotic, I'm undisciplined, creating, creative, but then I'm like, this is really a fucking deadline. Make a decision. Make a decision. And um, deadline plays a huge role. Then it's finished, right? Or you... Hmm? So it's like the limit and then done. Kind of, yeah. There's this, a deadline really plays a huge role. I respect people who can write concept albums and just finish them and prepare all of this stuff. But for me personally, Kind of need pressure. Mm. Can you also, uh, like, um, to this topic, uh, you also show, like, your unfinished or almost finished projects to, to like, your friends and stuff? Because, like, I often had the experience, like, I had some, some stuff I've been working on and I've been showing it to a friend or something, and it was always the stuff that I liked the, the least. They they like, oh yeah, this is so good, and like the stuff I, I, I thought was super, super good, and it was like, yeah, it's nice. I yeah. think it's good to send people stuff. I wouldn't send it to too many people. You're going to get confused. Choose very carefully who you're going to send it to. I think with the people I send it to, I think I almost know their opinion already before they're going to send it back, which is maybe I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. And it depends whether you're getting like a musical opinion or you're getting some sans Nazi opinion. You know what I mean? Like a very technical opinion or a... I would choose a few people, one, two, three people max who you send it out to, and they're your people kind of thing, you know? Mm -hmm. It's confusing, but it's good to get it sent out and get proper feedback. Just um, my question was, um, how do you feel about sampling? And like maybe if someone sampled your work and you heard it somewhere, how would you feel about that? Can you the yeah. question is about sampling, sorry, I have to repeat again, uh, how you feel about sampling, when the, whether you sample and when your own work is being sampled. I don't sample so much. It's like, as I said, like I cur I'm playing stuff and curating the gold. It's almost like I'm sampling myself, right? But I have nothing against sampling. I think it's completely fine. Um, uh, you can go to freesound.org and get so much free stuff. If somebody samples my music, I'm actually not bothered, as long as they don't make tons of money with it and not include me, I'm not bothered. It's so we already screwed as musicians, basically. Mm. We already screwed. Either be in it for the journey or not. Mm. And choose your battles, I would say. <laughs> Battle with someone who made a lot of money with your music, not with someone who, you know. And what's your opinion about like, um, controlled uh, chaos, or like controlled coincidence, like randomization, or like grasshopper? Is there like any rules, or is there like no rules, whatever? I think for a certain period there can be no rules and then at some point you gather all the stuff and you sort of turn it into something that makes sense. That's also what I mean a bit like by curating the gold and you know it's it's hard but if you have some in, it also you this happens more over time, you know, when you have a few things where you think that all fits together then you can try and funnel stuff, you know, channel stuff in that direction. But I think this I I mean the chaos just kind of happens to me. I don't plan it. <laughs> This happens to me. <laughs> and is there like anything that you hold back? Like for example, like a, a sample or like a specific like thing that where you say, okay, I'm not like ready for this yet, or is it just like, like is there any cap? Yeah. 
Okay, I'll give you an example. I know lots of people with modular gear, and if I want to go and record a bunch of stuff on their modular gear, I can, and I do occasionally, but I'm not going to start going to Superbooth and just collecting everything. I just can't be bothered. I don't think that is my... I don't think that is what I need to do in this life so much. That's just an example. I don't think I'm going to start building loads of stuff with Reactor. I think the, what I have to share with the world, I shouldn't sit too much just sitting. I want to make something, and what I make it with, in a way, is irrelevant. I think the abundance, using an abundance of things for me is more interesting than going like, no, I'm going to get all this modular gear and make a whole album of it, because probably by that time I'd just lose my erection, literally. <laughs> Another question here, this corner more. Expensive fun. <laughs> And I would have another follow-up question. You mentioned it twice already that you kind of saw your practice almost as a spiritual one. Hmm. I'm very interested about that because um, I, I feel like the, let's say, mm, the, the Western normative narratives that kind of separate mind and matter and, you know, know, psyche and uh, materiality and imaginability is, is a very strong dominant narrative, but it, it comes to an end. I don't believe in this dualism. Um, so I'm curious, um, could you elaborate on this yeah. idea of spirituality okay. One example. in your practice? One example, every religion uses music, right? Can anyone name a religion where they just don't use music? Well, music is obviously a really strong force of propaganda and brainwashing, which is why people do it. They build buildings with loads of reverb, people sing at you, and you're shitting your pants about God. They've been doing that for centuries. So there is this thing about sound and spirituality, and it's also from all forms of art. I think it's the one where you can just sit a human in front of some sound. Now, see something. It's different to reading something or seeing an installation. It's, it's sound which affects people in an emotional way. So that, to me, is a form of spirituality. Secondly, community, the people you surround yourself with, you know, the people you get from music, if you are in a nice place musically, you just, that is, a f I mean, what is uh, religion apart from that? It's the community, some ideas, right? I mean, even the ideas I was talking about, about sound and space and time, these are pretty kind of like spacey sound religion. And every religion's used sound, and all humans have been just like banging on stuff. It's a form of, it's an intrinsic form of communication for me. Okay, so if there's no more question, we do, yes, do we have another question? also very active in the club scene, right? Yeah. And I know you played a huge role when it came to grime, like around 2008 or something. Can you tell? Okay, I did grime. I put. I moved to Berlin in 2000, and then I started making music. But I was also got involved with grime parties. A friend of mine, someone I met who worked for Arta and filmed grime artists like Skepta and D Double, people like that. I booked them in 2004. It's the first time they'd ever come to Berlin booked a bunch of different grime artists over about a year or two. Some of them had to get passports to get here because it wasn't yet like easy jet travel time. Some of these kids had actually not left England. Some of them were like, where's the KFC? <laughs> and it was uh, fun. I had a really good time doing this. And then there's lots of people like Sarah and a lot of people who've done parties after that who came to this party because it was like a bass music party from Britain. So, yeah, I started as a music consumer and I've done the promoter stuff. I've worked on the, par I've worked on the door, I've worked on the garderobe, I've worked on the bar, I've done everything in this. I've curated stuff and, yeah. There's another question. Um, with these, like, um, I guess, like, crime, DJ, crime, jungle events and stuff, so do you have, like, a problem where, because you're in Berlin, you have, like, a lot of British people coming, like, was it hard to... When I did them in 2004, there weren't that many British people here, right? I moved to in 2000, and people were shocked that I came from London. They were like, why would anyone move from London to Berlin? We all just want to go to London. They were really shocked. And people of colour were, like, on the floor. <laughs> they were like, why would you move from there to here? They were, I was like, I don't know, I'm a masochist, right? Um, the, the whole, like, tons of British people coming really only started for me around 2008, or five, six, seven, like this. So... Um, no, it's also really funny when people like Scuba moved here, some other, like this Tayo, this guy done a Fabric Live compilation, messaged me and was like, can you look out for Scuba? I mean, that's what it was like. They were like, 
oh, I better call my mate. Now nobody's going to call you about anyone moving here from Britain because already the, all their cousins live here or whatever, their mates. Completely different. It was not, there weren't that many British people here. There were a few, but not so many. But what was really touching about the grime thing was that when you book Ghanaian British artists, that like Ghanaian kids from Hamburg would come down to Berlin with like Ghana flag. It was, it was a cute kind of, it was definitely special. Last chance for a question. Otherwise, I come to our takeaways. So, quick and spontaneous, what are your takeaways of tonight? <laughs> That's <laughs> mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Activate, quick, yes. Um, I don't know, finding shit in the golden shit. Finding golden shit. Gold digging in the shit. Di yeah. Gold digging in the shit. Yes. Uh, your taste is the most important thing. Your taste is the most important thing? Individuality. Not being perfectionist. That's good, actually, the whole thing about not being perfectionist or no purist. I see something coming in? No? Me? Mm -hmm. I was about to say the same thing. I also think that, I always say this, look, for every artist you think is amazing, they have a hard drive of the most awful shit you have ever heard in your whole life, the most mediocre trash. If they're clever enough not to release it, everything's fine. So when you make something shit, don't worry about it, just don't release it. Quite simple, just know the difference, which is what you said, you know, like, in a way, your taste, your instinct. Okay, and one more takeaway, yes, back row. Not to be intimidated by technology. I really like the kind of... I think the key to that is playing with it alone. That's the only way. When there's someone sitting next to you, you're always going to be like this. But when you're alone, you're like, I can't fuck this up. My mum started messing around with logic at the age of 70. I was reading a glossary. I was like, why are you reading a glossary about the word gain? Just mess around with it. I really think the only way to really learn is alone. You can, of course, go back to other people, but only alone can you, can you, are you totally free to fuck everything up and look like a total dick? So one of my key uh, takeaways is the term of availabil availabilism. Mm -hmm. Availabilism? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Like, work with what's available and, you know, make that work. Uh, I think that's very beautiful and very um, liberating in a way, no? Thought. Yeah, it's meant to be liberating. With you, when you pull that down to availabilism and not perfectionism, it becomes a much more accessible thing for everybody. Yeah. So I come now to my very final question. Everyone gets the same question. Um, what's your final piece of advice you could give to this mixed... Don't give up your day job. No, <laughs> <laughs> mixed group of students and listeners. I mean, I'm not saying don't give up your day job, but the reality is if you want to be really an artist for the rest of your life, you might run into some money at some point. When you run into that money, use it wisely. Don't spend it all on clothes and drugs because there's going to be a day when you're not going to get that. So you want to look like on a long scale. Um, I, mean, I think it's a wonderfully realistic that's day. Also Keep your day job. People, <laughs> that's also true of people who are not in music. That's people who just like hustle and get that tech job and da da da, you know? So that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Then I would say a warm applause for Sasha. Thank you. Thank you to you guys. Thank you to you, Sasha.